Palestinian swap shop news. And uh, there was a major prisoner exchange that took place this week in the Middle East. Uh, Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier uh, who was captured age 19 in 2006 and spent the last five years held captive in Gaza, uh, something that, incidentally, he shared with the majority of the other residents of Gaza. <laughs> I guess they just had fractionally more space to move around. He was finally released by Hamas in a deal with the Israeli government whereby the Israeli government would return a 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. That's a pretty depressing exchange right, Andy. The <laughs> Palestinians seem to have suffered hyperinflation in terms of the value of their prisoners. That's right. There's and now not... 0. 0.001 Israelis to the <laughs> Palestinians. <laughs> that's, that's just catastrophic, yeah. that exchange rate. Now, you might be thinking, wow, that must be one hell of a 24-year-old Israeli prisoner now. <laughs> yeah. It's the... a, it must be the most amazing. That's, it was 1,027 Palestinians and a couple of first-round draft picks as well. <laughs> But he must have been an ama- amazing... So all, he was a tank crewman, John. Yeah. What a tank crewman he must have yeah. been to be worth a thousand... Maybe he could melt and reform. Or maybe he's well, got a magic nose. But he definitely does put a lot of pressure on young Gilad's shoulders. He, he's like a young footballer who goes to a huge club for a record-breaking fee and who then has to live with the price tag over his head as people <laughs> wait for him to do something to justify it. What I'm saying, Andy, is that Gilad Shalit is the Theo Walcott of political prisoners. <laughs> he's got to produce, and he's got to produce fast, or the critics are going to start circling. Sports uh, uh, writers in the Jerusalem <laughs> Post are already apparently publishing columns saying that, at best, Gilad was worth 300 Palestinian prisoners, <laughs> and this just shows that the transfer market has gone mad. It's all his agent. It's all his five years of talking him up, John. It's just, you know, the agent just driving his transfer value. But also imagine how those 1,027 released Palestinians must feel. I think, is that all I'm worth? Yeah. Is that... You know, I'm, a, I'm a proven murderer, stroke, stroke political prisoner, delete, <laughs> as applicable. Is that all I'm worth? 0.001 19-year-old Israelis? I want out. I want to go work somewhere where I'm properly valued. I want a job in Ikea. That is, it's going to be tough psychologically if you are a released Palestinian. You're basically worth one of Gilad Shalit's fingernails. That must be so hard to deal with. <laughs> Israel initially refused to negotiate at all, but later entered indirect talks brokered by Egypt with the involvement of a German mediator. A German mediator, Andy. A German mediator. The world's changed, that's all I'm saying. The world's changed. Both sides hailed the deal as a victory, and it's a very rare situation to have a day when both Israel and Palestine are celebrating at the same time. And it doesn't involve dead bodies and flag burning. So we really have to cherish these moments when they come around. They're like solar eclipses. The truth is that Israel is a country that has national service. Most Israelis have children or know of children in the army. And and the Gilad Shalit situation over the last five years has captured the imagination of people. And the Israelis really should be commended for taking such a sustained emotional interest in having a soldier return home from capture at all costs. America on the other hand, seem to have compassion deficit disorder when it comes to soldiers. I guess it's from no longer having a conscript army. Because compare the five years of attention for Gilad Shalit with Bo Bergdahl, the young American soldier captured by militants in Afghanistan two and a half years ago. You don't hear about that guy every day on the news here. In fact, you don't hear about that guy on the news here at all, Andy. (laughs) At all. There's very little in this agreement as well that hasn't been on the table for years. Hamas suddenly got interested in a big prisoner deal as soon as Mahmoud Abbas started lobbying the UN for official membership. This was incredibly popular in Palestine and Hamas were worried about the soaring approval ratings for Abbas and his non-violent approach to the peace process. Hamas have openly declared that they prefer the violent, violent approach. So... It was clearly a cynical political calculation to try and halt their own declining popularity in the occupied territories. And Netanyahu, on the other hand, wanted the release as a high-profile feather in his increasingly droopy-looking cap. (laughs) So does it not say something about the situation there, Andy, that both sides in the negotiation could only do this fundamentally positive thing if it was motivated out of pure spite? (laughs)